Welcome back everybody. In this video, we are going to set up our JavaScript development environment and we're going to understand some core concept, how we can run JavaScript in a web browser and how we're going to be using JavaScript throughout this module. And this is the first module I'm really excited. And in this module, we are going to understand the core concept of JavaScript. So first of all, if you take a look here, let's just say this is our web page. Now web page gets rendered because we use a file called HTML. Okay, so the HTML file gets rendered in a browser and becomes a page. And now this HTML file can link to a style file, which has an extension for CSS file. And also, this can link to a JavaScript file, which has an extension JS. All right, so we're gonna create these three files and we're gonna open that project in a WebStorm. And also I'll show you how you can open that in VS Code as well. So let's go here, this is a WebStorm and I'm in a desktop, I'm gonna right click and create a new folder. I'm gonna name it this folder as JavaScript folder. So I'm just gonna rename that with name to say JavaScript folder. I'm gonna open that. Right now it is empty. Now, if you're on a Windows, you should be able to open uh, a new folder and create some files, all right? In Mac, I'm gonna show you how you can create some files using terminal. So we'll open a terminal and I'm just gonna make it a bigger. And here we're gonna navigate to desktop and cd to JavaScript folder. And here we're gonna use a command called touch. And when I create index.html file, touch style.html file, sorry, CSS file, and then touch script.js file. Now I'm gonna close terminal and here in the folder, I can see I have three files now. So you can start writing HTML style or JavaScript file using any text editor, but it's always good to have some sort of an IDE or some advanced text editor, uh, such as WebStorm and VS Code. Now we're gonna open this folder in WebStorm. So I'll just click on open. I'll go to a desktop and then click on JavaScript and then click on open. And this is going to open this project in WebStorm. And if I click here, I can see I have these three files. Now, if you are using a free version of VS Code, you can open that in the Mac as well. So I have that installed. And here, if I want to open the same folder, I'll simply go to File menu and click on Open and navigate to the folder. And it's going to show you this pretty similar structure of the code. So let's close this. We have already seen that, how we can do that. So let me write some boilerplate code for HTML. So I'll say HTML. And then inside a head tag, we can simply say link. And I'm gonna say rel, that would be style sheet and source. Or you can do something really cool in WebStorm. You can simply click on the file and drag to your workspace. It will automatically put that link to your uh, web page. So here I'm gonna drag a JavaScript file as well. So at this stage, our index.html file is successfully linked to a style file and a JavaScript file as well. I'm gonna save the file and let's open a script file. Now here, I know you guys don't know nothing about JavaScript, but don't worry, we're gonna start from scratch. So first of all, let me open a Chrome browser. And this is the place where we're gonna start testing running our code. All right, so let's go and open that HTML file in a browser. So I'm gonna go back here and I'm gonna say something like H1, hello guys. I'm going to render this page. Let's save this file. And I'm gonna click here to the Chrome browser and it's gonna take me to the browser and open that HTML file into our uh, browser. So, now we're gonna to go to script file and I'm gonna write a code. If you don't really understand what I'm writing, don't worry, we're gonna talk about this. So I'm gonna type a console.log and I'll say hello, welcome to JavaScript 
course. I'm gonna save the file. And now let's go back to our browser and I'm going to open developer tools. So here we have a, some sort of a tools provided by Chrome for developing application for browser. So I'll click here on the menu bar and I'll go to more option. I'll click on developer tools and that opens up our developer tools. Now in the developer tools, uh, you might see developer tools at the bottom. So you can click on the menu and then change the, the place where you want to see the developer tool. So here we have element, which shows us whatever HTML we are rendering in the browser in the current page. So this is HTML. As you can see here, we have a hello guys. Next, we have a console. Console is a runtime JavaScript environment. So you can basically run your JavaScript in the console, test it, let me show you one more thing. So in the code, we have written this console.log. A console is targeting the browser console and we're calling a function that on that, which is a log. Means that please go ahead and write this to the console. So if I refresh the browser, I should see something. Hello, welcome to JavaScript course in the console. So as you can see, HTML file is linking to a JavaScript file. This is why we are seeing something written in the console. And if I go and change this to say, okay, we understand the console now. So let me just say, we understand the console. Let's save the file. Let's go back to the browser. I'm going to refresh the page. And now we have, we understand the console. I understand that you guys don't know what we're doing right now, but don't worry. It will start making sense several soon. Welcome back. In this video, we're going to talk about JavaScript syntax. Now, what is the word syntax? So syntax means that this is the rules that you write JavaScript. For example, if someone say, okay, I'm going to define a variable and we talk about variable in a second, but you will tell that, okay, I'm JavaScript and I want you to define a variable like that. You cannot follow the rules and regulation the way you want it, but you need to follow the rules and regulation provided by JavaScript. Now, first of all, we always have to store some information in the memory uh, in any programming language or in a computer. So we do that by defining a variable. So let's just say we can define a variable in JavaScript by using three keywords. So we have the first keyword war, we have a second keyword let, and we have a const. Now we will talk about what let and cost uh, in the later videos, but for now, just take a look at how we can define a variable and what happens when you define a variable. So what means that, okay, compiler, I'm going to define a variable and it will ask you, okay, what kind of variable you are going to define? So I'll say, okay, I will name a variable A, B, C. Now, when you say A, B, C, and then a semicolon. Now, a semicolon represents that, okay, you have finished defining a variable. Now, in the background, what happens is, let's say this is your computer, and we have some a memory in your computer. Now, we say var A, B, C, so the compiler will go inside your memory and allocate the location for ABC. So for example, this is ABC now. So we name this location in our memory named ABC. Okay, so I'm gonna remove some of the code here. And next, so let's just say I have allocated a variable named ABC and in the memory we have that. Now we wanna store some data into our memory location. So we can do that by using an assignment operator. Assignment operator is this equal to sign. So if I say A, B, C equal to, and I will say five, and a five is a data type which we are going to talk about uh, in the next video. So I'll say A, B, C is equal to five, and I type semicolon. Now what compiler will do now, compiler will take this value and 
put that value into this memory location. And now the memory location ABC will have this value. Now inside of our JavaScript code, if we say, okay, please compiler tell me what is ABC, it will give us back from here and it will show us five, which is stored in our JavaScript uh, variable and it will free from the memory location. Now let's take a look at the demo, what I just explained to you guys. So I'm going to go to a browser. So here I'm going to define a variable. So I'll say var and I'll say ABC and I'll press semicolon and press enter. Now if I say ABC again, it doesn't give me anything because it has that memory location stored in a memory, but it doesn't have any value. So if I say ABC is equal to five and I press enter, now it gives me back five. And this time if I go and say ABC and press enter, I receive five. So what's happening is the var keyword creates a memory location with the name you provide and that name called identifier. And then it will store the value using an assignment operator. So now we understand the concept of defining a variable. Now there's other concept that we can talk about. So let's go down. So we have defined a variable using var keyword and we say A, B, C. And on the same line, I can start defining the value for that memory location. I'll say is equal to five, okay? Now, we can define a variable using a let keyword, which we will talk about what is the difference between a let and a const and a var later in the course. But now we already know that how we can define a variable and what happens when we define a variable. So let me show you a couple more things about a variable. So we can define a variable by using var keyword and I'll say, variable a is equal to 10 that will create a variable a and set a value of 10 to a and then we will go to the next line and define another variable so instead of doing that we can be on the same line let me show you so i said var i can say a is equal to 5 and i'll say comma b is equal to 10 and I can keep going, C is equal to 15, and then I type semicolon. Now, this will create three variables, so we don't have to type var, var, var uh, for every variable we define. So, there's another thing that I want to talk about is if I say var is equal to A, comma, B, comma, C, and I add a semicolon. Now this time it will create three variables, but it will not define any value or it will not store any value inside these variables. So now we understand the concept of defining a variable. Now let's talk about a variables a bit more in details. So for example, we define a variable. I'm gonna change the color to orange. So we define a variable by using a var keyword. So let me go and define a variable using a var keyword. And then we will define the name of the variable. So we can simply say a, and then we use an assignment operator to store a value. So what are these things? Now this thing here is a keyword to define a variable. This thing here is called identifier okay in programming language this thing here is called assignment operator okay that is a, a value which is going to be stored inside our identifier and when we write this uh, line of code var a is equal to 5 this is a memory name a stored in your computer which will have a value of 5 so we are defining an identifier named a is there any limitation on defining uh, identifier 
Yes, there is. You cannot define a variable starting a name with comma or with this top hat or any weird characters. Okay, there are some rules and regulation provided by JavaScript that you have to follow to define an identity for, for, uh, for a variable. So what are those? Let me change the color, makes it cooler red. Now, if I say I'll define a variable var and I'll say comma a, b, c, this is going to cause an error in our code. This is not going to work because we use this a comma character for our identifier. So what can be used to define an identifier in JavaScript? So in JavaScript, you can define an identifier starting with a letter that could be A to Z, okay? And also we can define a variable starting with underscore. And also we can use a dollar sign to define a variable. So if I say var underscore a, this is going to be perfectly fine. If I say var dollar sign a, this is going to be okay. And also if I use a, b, c, or any character from a to z, a letter, sorry, not a character, which is going to be fine. JavaScript is not going to cause any error. Now we talked about our identifier and its syntax and its limitation. Next thing, we're gonna have to understand some variable scope as well. But we can talk about variable scope later in the course because that involves functions and other stuff as well. Let's take a look at the demo, whatever we learned and understood about a variable. So let's go to the web storm and here I'm gonna start defining some variables. So I'll say var a is equal to five and add a semicolon. We're gonna say var b is equal to 10. And then we say var c is equal to six. Okay, now we are specifically defining three variables, a, b, and c, and we stored five, 10, and six. So this is perfectly fine, doesn't cause any errors. WebStorm is pretty advanced, it can give you some suggestion and some uh, some imp and offer some improvement for your code as well. So I'm gonna save the file and to see those variables in our console, we can use the function called console.log and in the parentheses, I'm going to define a, add a semicolon. We use a console.log, we can simply say b. We can say console.log, we can say C. I'm going to save the file, and here I'm gonna refresh the page. Now here you can see we have uh, text, we understood the console, we have five, 10, and six. So if I say B and press enter, it gives me 10 back, because it knows what is B, because we specifically defined B as a variable in our code, which is linked to this HTML file. So we can define a variable here as well. So let's take a look at that. So I say var e is equal to, let's just say 100, press enter, and I'm gonna press e and enter, it gives me 100 back. Now var, if I say top head abc is equal to 50, press enter, that is going to give me an error because saying uncut syntax error, and it gives you this, okay, you cannot define a variable using top head before our identifier. So I'll say var, okay, you don't let me do that, but can I use underscore? So if I say var underscore, a, B, C is equal to 50, I press enter, that's perfectly fine. So if I say underscore A, B, C, press enter, it gives me back 50. And also if I say var dollar sign A, B, C, D is equal to 50, press enter, and I can use dollar sign A, B, C, D, enter, that gives me 50 back as well. So we can, do, we can use underscore, we can use dollar sign, uh, to define variable identifier. All right, so now let's talk about JavaScript case sensitivity. So we defined a variable, for example, we define a variable var a is equal to five. I'm gonna define another variable, var a is equal to five. 
Now what's happening here? Here we have used a lowercase letter. Okay, now here we have used uppercase letter. So I define uppercase letter. Okay, now what happens in our JavaScript code that if you define a lowercase letter and you define an uppercase letter, these things are pretty much the same character, but in terms of programming, they are totally different. So what happens in a memory? So what will happen is we will have another location. We will have a second location. This will have a lowercase a. This is uppercase a. And these two are different things. One more thing. So if I define var s lowercase and I define s uppercase, these two things are totally different. Okay, we can take a look at the demo as well in the console. So let's go to the browser and here I'm going to clear the console by clicking on this button. So I will say var a is equal to 10. And I'll say var capital A is equal to 50. Press enter. Now if I say a enter, I get 10. And if I type capital A, I get 50. So as you can see in the console, we can see lowercase a and uppercase a is pretty much a two separate things. So in theory, if I define, uh, let's just say a cat variable and I say cat with capital C, these two cats are different. That could be like this cat with this body, two legs, and this cat could be a bigger face, a body rectangular, and then two legs. But these two cats are not linked to each other. They are two different things. And I hope you understood the concept of case sensitivity. So lowercase letter is not equal to uppercase letter. They are two separate things. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to understand a JavaScript statements. So a computer program is a list of instructions to be executed by a computer. In programming language, these programming instructions are called statements. A JavaScript program is the list of programming statements and JavaScript statements are composed of values, operators, expression, keyword, and comments. Now, I've said a lot of words. Uh, we know about a value. We know about operator. We know about expression. Not exactly, right? Okay, never mind. We'll talk about expressions. We know about keyword and comments, I said, right? We don't know about the comments. So, let's say a keyword. Let's just say, give you an example of war. It's a keyword, okay? Let me write that, it's a keyword. And we define an identifier for this variable. We just say, uh, maybe we say A, B, C. And that becomes identifier. Okay, now this is another uh, example of an, a keyword. Now we have is equal to sign. This is an example of uh, operator. So we say operator. Okay, now we have an example of value, which is five. And I'm going to remove this. Let me change the color of to, I hope you like this orange color. I like the orange color. Now this is a kind of a statement. Not exactly all but just this bit. This is a statement because it has some instruction to the computer to run this. What is the instruction? It says, okay, create a variable name ABC and assign the value of five to ABC. Now this is some kind of a, a statement in JavaScript. Now most JavaScript programs contains many JavaScript statements. Statements are executed one by one in the same order they are written. So for example, if I say var a is equal to 
5 var b is equal to 10 var c is equal to 15 now let's just say this guy is a compiler of a javascript its job to read this statement and then send this statement in our binary one zero one zero one 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 zero 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 one 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 whatever these statements get compiled into a binary language this guy will compile these and then we'll send this to our computer to run this code because our computer does not understand what we are talking about in the statement it doesn't understand what is what it doesn't understand what is a it doesn't understand what is five it only understand ones and zeros now this guy its name is compiler okay now this guy has some sort of a rule it says when I see these statements I'm only going to compile the first statement first and then onwards it is not going to compile this statement first and then go to compile this statement it's not gonna do that it's gonna start from the top and then go uh, one by one and it's gonna compile every statement one by one so this is how this program in JavaScript gets compiled and statements get compiled as well. Now, a couple of small things we talk about in this video is JavaScript white spaces. So JavaScript ignores multiple spaces. You can add white spaces to a script and make it more readable. For example, if I say what, I'll say my name. Let's just say always. And I'll just make this space space don't worry these are nothing but just the spaces okay and I'll just write all the way here and I'll say five now that guy compiler we don't want to draw this we'll take this and say oh okay I don't really care about this gibberish I don't really understand this I want to ignore this and it's gonna say okay what a waste and right jump into this and then go right to five so white spaces are ignored in javascript we talk about javascript code block as well but that's a little bit advanced topic we talk about that when we talk about the functions so there are some reserved keywords in javascript let's go down so we have seen the keyword war we have other keywords as well. For example, let me give you some examples of the keywords. We have a continue keyword. We have a for keyword used for loops. We talk about that. We have a function keyword. And then we have if and else keywords as well. There's a bunch of keywords available in JavaScript. Now, we understand the statement in JavaScript. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to understand comments in JavaScript. Now, before we talk about comments in JavaScript, I would like to say that comments are available in any programming out there, whether it's a Python, C++, Objective-C, Swift, Java, Ruby on Rails, any programming out there will have comments. Now, what are comments and why do we need comments in our code? For example, I'll go and write a code. Let's say I will say war and I'll name this blah, blah, blah. I'll say is equal to 20. Now, this code or statement written by this fellow. This is the fellow. Now, this fellow write this line of code. Now, what happens is there is another fellow which is going to work on his code when he leaves from work. So, let's say this guy go, okay, I'm going to start working on the code 
And if this guy goes, okay, I'm gonna read this code, but this doesn't really make sense. What is a blah, blah, blah? Now, to understand what is blah, 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 if that guy has written some sort of text, so let's just say this guy says, this is, let's just say a variable name, or it could say something else about this. So what happens when this guy doesn't write anything about this line of code, this new guy will not understand. And here is a problem. And this is going to think about, oh, what the hell is going on? What is this? So to avoid that scenario, we have comments. And in JavaScript, if, if I want to write a comment about this statement, I will say, I will say here, I'll say defining a variable name okay and now if I write this in a code that will definitely cause an error because this is not going to be very helpful for a compiler so the compiler will come say hmm what is this English written here to make this line of code or line of uh, line of strings we haven't used the word strings yet but this paragraph we are going to write double slashes just before we start writing our comment. And that will be able to uh, recognize as a comment. So for example, I'm gonna go down, I'll say another comment here. This is my first comment. Okay, now when this guy, let's say this is a compiler, okay? And that compiler comes to this line of code and say, oh, I found something here. I know this is a comment. So it will ignore this line of code. So the comments are only helpful for the developers, not for the compiler. So we just write a comment for our own understanding. So if I go to my code the next day, I should be able to understand what I wrote yesterday. So this is how we write comments. Now to take a look at the demo in the code, I have written this code. So here, if I write double slash, and that gets grayed out. Now, this basically is not going to execute it in our code anymore because we have commented out. This is just for us now. So if I say, okay, I'll say double slash, this is my first comment, okay? Or I can say double slash console.log and I'm trying to write a comment. Okay, now this has a function console.log, but it's not going to get uh, logged on a console. So I'm gonna save this file. Let's go to the browser. I'm gonna refresh the page. So if I refresh the page, I get, we understand the console. I got back 10 and then six. And as you can see, we got 10 and six back. And we didn't really get A because now it's a comment. A compiler will understand that as a comment and will not do anything about it. We'll just skip that. And the comments are only for our developers to help them understand the code maybe the next day or next year or after 10 years. So comments are great. Make sure you write a lot of comments about your code because they're gonna help you a lot. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about data structure and types available in JavaScript. And this is the most important topic throughout this module. Now, data types are basically the types of the value you're going to store in the memory. So we have seen var, we can say var a is equal to five. Now this thing here is a value, okay? Now we need to understand what type of value is this? Is this a number or is this a string? So what type of value is that? That becomes its type. So to understand that, we have some data types in JavaScript. 
So the first type we have is a number. Next we have a string. We have a null. We have undefined. We have a boolean. And then we have a symbol. Okay, so these are the six types or primitive which are provided by latest JavaScript. Now, an example of a number can be one, two, three, four, five, or six. And also we can define a number in a decimal places, for example, 2.5 or 3.8, okay, or 4.1. We can define a decimal places as well. A string is a sequence of characters. So for example, A is a character. And if I say A, B, C, or if I say always, which is my name, that is a sequence of characters which makes it a string. Or a passage or a paragraph can be a string. So to say, this is a paragraph. So we need these data types to store information in the memory. A null, what is a null? A null is just an empty variable. So null has a, a value, but which is empty. It's nothing that undefined means that a variable, let's just say var was defined, but it was undefined. So there was no value stored in that. A Boolean is very important which can be true or false. So let's say if I have this mobile here, I can say, okay, is this phone on or is this off? So whether it's gonna be on or it's gonna be off because it cannot be on and off at the same time. There is only one possibility in Boolean, either it's true or it's false. Now the symbol is a new data type which we will have a separate video I will talk about that in the another video so it's a new data type was introduced uh, in ECMA6 now this is basically a specification provided by the organization called ECMA which provides a specification of a JavaScript in simple words, they add new features into JavaScript and deprecate features in JavaScript. Now let's go down and let's talk a little bit more about uh, data types. Now, when you define a number data type, you can say just an integer, which can be five, or a multiple integers, so let's say five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, or whatever, that will become a number type and these are basically an integer so we just simply say these are integers okay also we can say a decimal data type I don't have to write an arrow here but I'll say 2.5 or 6 7 8 now that becomes a decimal decimal value now all of these or integer sorry not integer this is integer this is decimal but both of these has a type number okay we understand how we define a number what about string so we say go down let me go and change the color and make it more nicer let's just say green green i like green so i say var and i'll say Okay, this is my name. Now if I go into the code and I say erase, and this is going to cause an error because to define a string, we need to wrap this in single quotes or double quotes. So this is a single quote. We can have a double quotes as well. Now string is a sequence of characters. So we have character A, we have a W, A, and I, and S. This makes it a string. All right, 
next data type we have null. So if I say var a is equal to null, which means the variable is defined but the value is null, there is nothing in there, it's empty. Similar to now we have undefined, which means that it's basically not defined yet, but down the road it may be defined. So A is available, but it's not defined yet. So down the road it could be defined as well. Now the last data type we have an object. So this needs a separate video. It's uh, a bigger topic to cover in this video. So we have covered a data types, a basic data type in uh, in theory. Now let's go to the code and let's try understanding these data type. So if I just go here and I'm just gonna remove the console log as well, I'm gonna save the project and here I'm gonna define a variable and I'll say, okay, A is equal to five or two, or I can say two uh, comma and make it a decimal value. Or I can say what B is equal to five, six, whatever the number you want to have. And that makes it a type of number. We have a string, we say var, and I'll say my name is equal to, and I have to specify a double quotes or a single quotes and wrap my string. So I'll say this is the string, okay? Next we have var, and I'll say null is equal to this. And this is gonna cause an error because null is a keyword, we cannot use that as an identifier. So I'll say null value, okay? So we say null, okay? We have a var, we say undefined, which is another keyword, it's not gonna let me do it, so undefined value is equal to undefined, all right? We have a symbol data which we'll talk about later in the course, but let's look at these now. So we have defined all of these types. I'm just gonna save the project. Let's go to the browser. Let's refresh the page. And let's say, I wanna check the type of A, okay? So I have a function built into JavaScript to check the type of a variable value stored in that. So I'll say type of, I say A enter and that gives me in a string form what is the type of a variable a that gives me number we know it's a number let's look a look at the code it's number but this was a decimal remember so javascript has only one number type you can store decimal values or integers in number now we have a variable named my name let's take a look at what is the type of that my name let me check whether it's available in our code or not. So I'll say my name, press enter in the console, it gives me a string, this is a string. Now I use the function type of, and I say my name, and I press enter, and that gives me a string. It's telling me it's a type string. So we check uh, null value and undefined value in the console as well. So we say uh, type of, null value, press enter, that gives you an object. Because it's an object type, it's not a primitive data type. Let's say type of undefined value, press enter, this is an undefined. So null is basically empty, there is no value in that, that means it returns an object. An object type is a bit advanced, we'll talk about that later in the course. So this is how you define uh, a data with a type. Welcome back everybody. In this video, we are going to talk about JavaScript operators. We'll take a look at the theory first and then we'll take a look at the practical demo of the operators as well. So what is an operator? Operator is, is a character that does some operations. We have seen one operator already, which was this operator. Do you remember what did we call it? This was, let me just write this here, that was assignment operator. Okay, now what it does, 
it basically takes identifier and then put the value right after the assignment operator to its identifier. So that value will go and will be stored inside A. This is happening because of this operator. So this is an assignment operator. So next we take a look at some of the mathematical or arithmetic operators. So we have a plus, we all know. So if you wanna say two plus two, that equation will become four because it's a plus operator, it adds to the left to the right or right to the left. So we have a subtract operator, well, two minus two, that will become zero. So it subtracts this to this. So that left with zero. We have a multiplication operator. These are the basic stuff that I don't wanna really go through, but I'm just saying it that you can perform uh, arithmetic operations in JavaScript. So we have a divide, we represent divide like this. We have a modulus, which returns the remainder. That's a basic math. Then we have a decrement and increment operator. So these are just arithmetic operators in JavaScript. Then we have increment and decrement operators. So this plus plus is increment operator. Increment operator. All right. And then we have minus minus, which is a decrement operator. So let me explain to you what is uh, so decrement operator. Okay, so what is plus plus and what is minus minus? So for example, we change the color to this color now. For example, if I say one plus plus, okay, what it means is one plus one. Okay, so if I say two plus plus, this means two plus one. If I say three plus plus, this means three plus one. So there is something called a loop in programming that we have to do one task over and over again. So these operators are pretty handy. You could write these by adding plus one every time, but if you simply say plus plus, the compiler will understand, okay, we're trying to add one to its current value. So let's say I define var a is equal to one, okay? And then I go and say a plus plus, okay? Now, what is the current value of the a right now? So we said a plus plus, that means a is equal to two now, because when we did a plus plus, it did this operation, it just add a to one. And a has a value of one before, so one plus one becomes two. How about that? Okay, makes sense? So this is an increment operator. We'll take a look at the demo as well. Now, similar to a decrement operator, we have a minus minus. So if I say, let me just go down a bit. So let me just remove this line of code. Uh, okay, so now if I say a is equal to five, and then I go next line and say a minus minus. So compiler will perform this operation. So you will say a will be equal to a minus one. So right now a has the value of five and we minus one, which becomes four. So a will it be is equal to four now. So basically plus plus and minus minus is an increment and decrement, which basically increment by one and decrement by one as well. Now we have a JavaScript assignment operators. We've seen that. Let's just change the beautiful color to this color. So we go down. Now assignment operator assigns values to JavaScript. So in addition to just a simple this assignment operator, we can add something like plus equal to or minus equal to, or we can say multiply equal to, or we can say divide, sorry, divide equal to, or mod 
equal to so what is mean by equal to let's take a look at the scenario okay so we have a variable we define a and we set that equal to let's just say five we have another variable b is equal to let's just say five okay so if i say a plus equal to b what does that mean do you know what does that mean that means it will perform this operation it will say a is equal to a plus b okay now what was the value of a that was five and b had the value of five as well so which means a is equal to five plus five that means a is equal to 10 now make sense so if you type let's just say a multiply is equal to b that means a is equal to a multiplied by b okay that's the assignment plus you add arithmetic operator that becomes this now next thing we're going to talk about some of the string operations so a plus operator can also be used as a concatenate operator so if i say a is equal to 2 plus 2 so we know that 2 plus 2 will be equal to 4 but how about if we have a string we want to add two strings together so if i say a is equal to uh, a b c plus c d f and what's going to happen it's going to cause an error because string always goes into single code or double code now we're using this plus operator what it's going to do basically it's going to set a is equal to a b c d c d and f okay now this is called a concatenate operator because this is a concept for polymorphism because the operator will act be depending on the values around it so values of strings around it that means it will act like it's going to concatenate it's not going to apply addition it's going to be a concatenate operator now so what about adding strings to numbers so if i say a bar a is equal to uh let's just say five string plus five and what happens the result of five and five will be what do you think can you guess we can just take a demo for all of these right now so let's just go to the code and here i will say var a is equal to and i'll say five plus five and then we'll do a console.log and say a. Let's save the file and we go to the browser. I'm going to refresh the page. Now I get 55 because 5 cannot be added to 5. So this thing, this thing makes this as a string as well. The reason why it does that because 5 is an integer and 5 is a string. So this 5 is integer and this is a string. Okay, when you add integer to string, the integer will become a string and that will be concatenated with this 5 because there's no way that 5 can add to its string because string will always be concatenated with this plus operator. Now we're going to take a look at some other demos as well. So we go to the browser, I'm going to make it a bigger. And here if I say 2 plus 2, press enter, I get 4. So if I say var 2, so a is equal to 2 plus 2, that's an error because we haven't assigned an assignment operator. So I'll say var a is equal to 2 plus 2. Press enter, a will should have 4. So we can use 2 minus 2, 5 minus 6, that gives us minus 1 as well, and 10 minus 3. So these are the automatic operations that I'm performing here. Okay, so now we use some, some of the uh, multiplication division as well. So we say, okay, 
3 multiplied by 3, that should give us 9. We have 4 multiplied by 4, that should give us 16. We can divide as well, so let's say 12 divided by 4, that gives us 3. 12 divided by 11, that gives us some decimal values, so 1.09090909090. So we know decimal operations. Now let's take a look at increment and decrement operator. So here I'm defined var as an increment is equal to a, or I can simply say one, okay? Enter. Now increment has a one in it, right? I'm gonna clear the console and close this one as well. So now if I say increment plus plus and I press enter, and now as you can see, it returned one, but if I say increment again, this should return two now because that is, the one was added to its own value. So which means that if var increment was incremented with one, it's a similar writing this line of code by just simply saying increment plus plus. Okay, that becomes three now. So similar to that, we can use a decrement operator. So if I say five minus minus, that gives us an error. So it's a minus minus five, that gives us an error as well because it cannot be applied to an integer directly. So if I say a is equal to five, and I'll say a minus minus, press enter, and I type A, that should give me a four now, okay? So we know about increment and decrement operator now, we understand the concept, how it does. Uh, let's take a look at the equal to and plus with that. So if I say var C is equal to 50, then I say var D is equal to, okay, plus equal to C. Now, take a look at this, D has no value at all. It's gonna add C to it. So D is gonna get added to C and then stored value will be a D value. So press enter, that gives us an error. Why is that? Because D has no value at the moment. If I say D, it doesn't know what, 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 what we're talking about. So if I said D is equal to 10, now I can say uh, war, not war actually, C plus equal to D. Press enter, that becomes 60. So if I say again, that becomes 70, 80, and 90. So it will add the value of C to D. Okay, let's clear this as well. Welcome back everybody. In this video, we are going to talk about JavaScript comparison operators. So the first we will look at the theory of comparison operator and then we'll go and take a look at in programming and I'll give you a demo how you can use comparison operator. So before we start, let me say there may be a places in your code where you want to check a value equal to another value. There may be a places you want to check whether that value is not equal to that value one uh, and also you have uh, scenarios where you want to check if one value is greater than or lower than one value so for that we have a comparison operators in javascript so for example let me say okay i want to check if five is equal to five okay or i want to check five equal to string five okay how do we check this or there may be a scenario where you want to check whether five not equal to five, okay? So there are a few scenarios. First, let's take a look at how we can check the equality, okay? So I'm going to change the color to, let's just say blue should be, should look nice. Okay, so for that, we have is equal to, is equal to operator. We have is equal to, is equal to, is equal to operator. We have a exclamation mark and then equal to, that means not equal to. Then we have greater than, we have less than, and then we have a greater than equal to, or we have a less than equal to. And then also we have a ternary operator, which I'll talk about uh, in a second. Okay, so equal to, equal to is a comparison, okay? comparison 
oops, I'll change this to comparison operator. Okay, and then we have a strict comparison operator. We we'll talk about what is mean by strict comparison operator in a second. So comparison, I'll just write this, you know what is this? So not equal to equal to okay and then we have a greater then excuse my bad handwriting but uh yeah you guys understand what's what i'm basically writing so that's all matter yeah so less than okay and then we have a less than or greater than equal to so greater than then equal to so i don't have to write equal to I can say okay equal to okay we have a less than and then I just type this like this and then we this is called ternary operator okay now we understand the theory let's take a look at the demo so if I want to check 5 equal to 5 what it should return it should return a boolean value whether if it's true or if it's false so right now 5 is equal to 5 that should return true okay I want to change this to true okay so if I say 5 equal to equal to 5 a string value then it should return true as well now what's happening here is that 5 is an integer and then 5 on the right side is a string. So this is a string and this is integer. Okay, so now this is going to get true because we are not strictly checking the type as well. We're just checking the value. So JavaScript is pretty dynamic which will basically convert the left hand side integer to string and then it will check that and that because we will get uh, true now we have strict checking operator so we if you type three times equal to that will check the type as well so this time it will return false okay let's change the color to green or maybe red color is looking cool so we've checked the equality and then we will have a not equal to similar to equal to guys we have exclamation mark which will check if it's not equal to not uh, so we have this and if you want to check strictly then you type not equal to is equal to is equal to that will check strict we have a greater than so let's just say five greater than five that should be returning false because 5 is not greater than 5 it's basically equal to 5 so if I say 5 I will say 5 greater than 2 and now it should return true instead of false okay so we take a look at that we've done this we, we know about less than and greater than operator as well that will return true or false uh, pretty basic math okay now this is a ternary opera this is important it's very useful in programming you find a lot of places where you can use a ternary operator okay so the ternary operator is basically uh, let me give you an example in theory first and then we try it out so if I say var a is equal to 5 okay so I can check on a now so if I say a question mark okay so now after you type a variable it will check the value of 5 inside that and then you type a question mark which makes it turn river if it say okay if a is equal to 5 okay here we are checking with the comparison operator so if a let me just write this again make it bigger okay so if I say a is equal to five that should give us true yeah because a is equal to five so we have true but we can add a ternary operator and say okay if a is equal to five then do this maybe we can say return true or we can say true 
and then if this will not be true then it will do this so here you can define a logic there as well so if it say okay console log something on the console so say not true let me let me give you a demo in the coding now all right so let's just go and remove everything here so i will write var a is equal to five right and then if i say a is equal to five right i'll use a ternary operator then we can say please console.log it's true okay is true okay and then you add a colon to if it's not right if it's not true then you say console.log and you can say it's not true I'm going to save the file let's go and refresh the browser and we should be able to see it is true okay because 5 a is equal to 5 so if I say here if a is equal to 6 which is not true then we should be able to see it is not true so right being in a console if I say 2 equal to 2 that should give me a return as true because it's fine yeah but if I say 2 equal to string to press enter that gives me true as well because it's going to convert dynamically to uh, integer true to string true which is which returns to true so we can check uh, our strict comparison operator so i said two equal to equal to equal to and i press enter there you go we get false now because it's strictly checking the type as well uh let's check some uh uh, greater than equal to as well so if i said two greater than two that should return false which is not right so which is right actually so two less than five yes it is true so basically these comparison operator will return true or false depending on the statement or equation you give it and uh, that will help you to make decisions in your programming welcome back talk about JavaScript operator precedence so you have seen a plus minus multiply and divide mod uh, operators these are some automatic operators that we have in JavaScript now what if I write 2 plus 2 multiplied by 4 what do you think it's going to do it's basically going to multiply 4 to 2 which becomes eight, and then it's gonna add two to eight, and the answer will be 10. Now, this is why, because the division and multiplication have a higher precedence. They will be performed before any other operator. So I'm just gonna remove this line of code, and we go and take a look at what other options we have. Now, we usually have brackets. Okay, so if I say 2 plus 2 multiplied by 4, now this thing, operator, uh, multiplication operator, is going to get performed after this bracket's going to get evaluated. Because in JavaScript, brackets have the highest precedence in any equation. So right now, what it's going to do, it's going to plus these two to to 4 and then it's going to multiply by 4 which becomes 16 so if we don't encapsulate that 2 plus 2 in brackets then what will happen is basically it will 2 plus 2 multiply by 4 which becomes 2 multiplied by 4 is 8 and then plus 2 the answer is 10 see the difference so here we have an answer 16 and here we have an answer of 10. So let me give you a quick demo. If we have a brackets in an equation, that value, that equation will be evaluated before anything else. Doesn't matter if it's a plus operator, a minus, or multiplication, or division. But if we don't encapsulate any of the equation in a brackets, then first it would have divide or multiply 
and then afterwards any calculation by uh, using these operator will be done after we have a plus and a minus so these two things get evaluated first and these two operators after okay so let's take a look at the example in coding so here I'm just going to clear the console and if I say 2 plus 2 multiply by 4 I press enter that gives me 10 now if I say okay 2 plus 2 within the brackets and then multiply by 4 that should give us 16 so as you can see that the brackets gets evaluated first and the value we get from the brackets will be multiplied to 4 and that's why we get a value of 16 so first brackets and then operator multiplication or division and then plus and minus so let's take a look at another so if I say uh, 4 multiply let's just add in brackets we said 4 minus 2 multiply by 2 close brackets and then we say okay minus 5 now let's take a look at what we should get in our uh, example so I'm going to write the same thing here first let's check what was that so 4 minus 2 multiply 2 minus 5 okay so let's just go here so we'll have 4 minus 2 multiplied by 2 close bracket and minus 5 so here the first thing in the brackets or this multiplication operator is going to get applied so that will become 4 minus 4 minus 5 and then we have 4 minus 4 is 0 and then 0 minus 5 that would be uh, just minus 5 let's take a look at what we get press enter and we get minus 5 as you can see that we are basically inside our brackets the multiplication will be evaluated first and then any other operator and then obviously after the brackets whatever is outside so this is how we have an operator precedence in JavaScript welcome back in this video we are going to talk about control flows in JavaScript so JavaScript supports a compact set of statements specifically control flow statement that you can use to incorporate a great deal of interactivity in your application so the most basic statement is a block statement that is used to group statements so the block uh, statement is delimited by a curly bracket so let's take a look at how we can use the block statement so let me say okay i want to write uh let's just say var a is equal to five var b is equal to six var c is equal to seven right so if i say this is a block of statement then i have to encapsulate it in a curly braces now this thing is a block and it has it its own scope we'll talk about scopes later in the course but just remember this word scope for now so this is a block of statement and a block of statements is commonly used with a control flow statement it could be if for a while or a function now let's take a look at the conditional statement which is one of the most important and one of the most used statement in any programming language the conditional so let me write condition no statement now what is conditional statement you might be thinking what the hell is that for example if I have this web page and I have this button here and I'll say click me okay this is a button click me and here I have a text for example let's say change this okay and I can say okay if this 
time, let's just say if it's uh, 9 p.m. So let me just write that, uh, 9 p.m. So let's just say 9 p.m. Okay, now I want to write a code which will basically check what time is this and then according to that it will change the text of change this. So I'll say if, okay, if there is a 9 p.m., let's just say 9 p.m., then we write a block statement and we can say, okay, if there's a 9 p.m., then if I click on this button, then we're gonna go and change this text to hello, it's 9 p.m., okay? And we can say, okay, if it's not 9 p.m., then do something else. So that would be else. We type else and we use another curly braces, another block statement and say, okay, change this to hello, it's not 9 p.m., okay? So we say, okay, we click the button and then there's a code in the condition conditional statement that will check whether it's a 9 p.m. or not. If it's a 9 p.m., then we change the text of this, or if it's not 9 p.m., then we change the text to, hello, it's not 9 p.m. So I hope that makes sense. So this is where we use a conditional statement. Now, what is the proper syntax of a conditional statement? So that would be if we start with a keyword, that's the that's a keyword, so let me write that on the top. Let me change the color to something like orange for the, that's a keyword, okay? And then we use a parenthesis. A parenthesis will take the condition. That would be a kind of a logic. It could be like, you can just, okay, five greater than five, or five is lower than 10, or 10 is greater than five you will write a condition here. So I'll say condition. Any logic which will return true or false. So this must return true or false. Okay, and then we use the block of code. And then here we'll write our statement. Okay, and that could be statement one, statement two, statement three, as much as statements you wanna put in there. So now if this condition return, let's say, let's say if this condition returns true, then this part of the code will be executed. So that's true, this part of the code will be executed. And if this is not true, we say else, then we write another block of code and here we have another statement and then we write as many as statement we want here and then if we have we have uh, this returning false so let me just go grab this if this is false this condition is false then this will be run so this part of the code will be executed so Pretty much we have if condition, okay, a block of code, else block of code. So that thing can return true or false. That thing returned true, then this is going to execute it. If this returned false, then this part of the code will be executed. So this is a conditional statement. Let's take a look at the demo now in the code. So we'll go here, I'm going to remove all the code here. And here we'll define two variables. I'll say var a is equal to, let's just say 10. Var b is equal to, I'll say five. Okay, now we're gonna start by typing if keyword and we use parenthesis and here I will say if a less than b right then we use a code block and then after that we write else 
this. So this is the proper syntax for writing a conditional statement, which is if and else. So if I say, okay, if A is less than B, then please console.log that A is less than B, okay? And if that's not true, if that returns false, then we need to say console.log, we can say A is not less than B. I'm gonna save the file, let's go to the browser, I'm gonna refresh the page, and now in the console I'll say A is not less than B. Let's check which is, okay, so if we have a 10, and then five and obviously we have 10 is bigger than five so it is going to return false that means we range to this line of code okay so if i change this to let's just say 15 so we say if a is less than b which is true now now it should print out a is less than b so let's go back and refresh the page and there you go, we should see A is less than B. So now we are in the true condition and before we were in the false condition. So this is how you write an if and else block. Now there are other scenarios that you have to check a multiple conditions. So you can do that by using else if uh, keyword. So here we have if and we have else. After this block of code, I will use this keyword else, if, and I can check here, uh, let's just say C is greater than B, okay? And then we use another block of code, and then we can say another variable on the top, we can define, oops, we can define another variable, var C is equal to, let's just say 20. Okay, or maybe we can say 12 to make it true. So we can say console.log and it says C is greater than B. Okay, I'm going to save the file. Now we can see that this is going to check whether if it's A is less than B. So it is true. So once this thing is true, this is not going to check this condition anymore. So let's go and refresh the page let's see what we get to so say a is less than b the reason why we were never going to check this condition because in the if and else or in if else only one condition can be evaluated so the first condition which becomes true will be evaluated the compiler will not bother going to the next line checking whether the next one was true or not for these kind of things, we have a logical operator that we will talk about in the next video. But just to show you guys that you can check a multiple condition within the same if and else or using else if conditions. So you can check that, you can chain all of this. Now, let's go and make this false for now. So if I say A is less than B, then we can say 16, which makes it false. Now we go refresh the page and I say A is not less than B. Okay, that's fine. But whether we check that C is greater than B, C is not greater than B. So we make this to, let's say 20. We wanna make sure that we get to this condition as well. And we check this and if it becomes true, then we execute this line of code. So let's refresh the page and now we should see C is greater than B. All right, so you can do uh, a block of uh, code inside of if, and then you can chain through that as well. Welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk about logical operators in JavaScript. So we've just seen how we can define a conditional statement using if and else block. So in regards to that, what if we wanna check multiple condition inside our if, instead of just checking one? So in the code, let's say I will define a variable a, and I set that equal to five, okay? I'll define a variable b, and I set that equal to, let's just say 10. And then we have another variable c, and I set that equal to 15. Now we write a if condition, so I'll say if, 
and now I want to check uh, multiple conditions okay so what if we want to check that if a is greater than b and b is greater than c then do this or c is greater than b and b is greater than a then do this so we can do that by using a logical operator so how many logical operators do we have available in javascript so we have a three logical operators so first one is and and then we have or which is this symbol and then we have not exclamation mark so this is we call it and this is or and this means not okay so let's just uh, put this aside for a second and we can just say okay just stay here and then we write our if statement on the top so right now if i say if c is greater than b now this is a one condition at the moment so c is greater than b this is one condition so we want to check a multiple conditions here i want to check that if c is greater than b and b is greater than a as well then we go down and perform this operation so i'll say and and b is greater than a and then we add a code block here and then we write our statement okay so if this is a multiple conditions available in if block and now when do we get this uh, let me just remove this bait we know about this as well so what how gonna happen now so let's say statement okay so now let's just say if compiler checks what about this if that's true let me just make it bigger if that becomes true then it's okay then it will go to the next condition now if that become true as well then it is okay then it will go and execute this statement all right but if any of the statement gets false, it will not execute the statement. It will go to the else block if there is any. So what about or? So if I say if C is greater than B, and I say or B is greater than A, then we run our statement here. Okay? Now what's going to happen here now? So this time compiler will come here. So let's say this guy is a compiler. Okay. This guy comes here and see, okay, there is an if condition. It will go and check for this first. So let me just remove this and change the color, make it better. So we check for this and we check whether if it's true or not. So if it's true, then straight away compiler will go to this statement and execute our statement because we are using this all operator so we have this all operator which means that one of these conditions so these are two conditions in if block if one of these gets true then go and run this condition but we used and before so this means both must be true did you get my point so this thing must be true both of these conditions then it will go and execute the statement but when we use all that means any of these are true then please go down and execute the statement so what if we have more than one condition so I can say here if C greater than B or b greater than a and c is equal to 5 and b is equal to 10. now as you can see we have a lot of going on here so we have too many conditions so now basically we'll compile let me draw a compiler here 
change the color so we can say okay mr compiler please go to the if statement it's gonna check for this and it's gonna check for this it's gonna check for this and it says okay if one of these are true okay if that's true because we have all operator here so it's gonna jump right into this block of code it's because and means we have to have this true as well so any of the condition is true here we can jump to the next condition and then evaluate that but when you use this kind of thing when you when you combine and and or together you better off encapsulating it in a uh, in a in a parenthesis so make sure that compiler will run this code if that's true then it goes to the next one and checks this and checks this and if all of them are true and it can go into this block of statements then it will execute that now let's take a look at the demo but first let me show you a not operator so say if let's just say we use exclamation mark and say if c less than b now what is going on here if it's going to say okay what's inside the c so if it say c is 5 and let's just say b is 10 and we have a block of code here so it's going to go and check for c value it's going to be checked for fall it's like an inverse system now so if b is 10 and c is 5 that means c is less than b right this is true right now this is true oops i need to bring it back this is right now true but it's not going to go and execute this line of code because we're using the exclamation mark here uh, let me just change the color so because we're using this exclamation mark here because we are checking for negate inverse so if it was not true then it would go and write this execute this line of code okay it's, it's, it's basically a block of statement that will be executed now i think it's time for us to take a look at our demo so we go here we can simply go inside the terminal and refresh the page and clear the console so we'll define a is equal to five we say what b is equal to 10 we say what c is equal to let's just say 15. Now we write if, and I can say if A is greater than B, then go down the line and run this condition. We say console.log, I can say A is greater than B. All right, and then we go next line, we close our block statement, press enter, and it's gonna give you an undefined because A is not greater than B. Now, to understand this logic, we can write in the code. So here we use this uh, if and if, uh, so if conditions here. So here I'm gonna concatenate this in the same if condition. So I say if A is uh, less than B and b is less than c then write this so right now it's going to go and check for a is less than b which is true and b is less than c which is also true as well so we save the file we refresh the page and here c is greater than b so as you can see we have c is greater than b nope we have to save this file and let's just refresh that again it's not actually refreshing so we'll have to do command r which will uh, download this from the web browser nope it's not running so we go back to index.html and rerun our server and that should be fine now okay so now it's saying a is not less than b let's check out so we have a is less than b okay what's going on here we say a which is 16 is less than b well this is not true already because 16 is not less than b guys so i have to change this to let's say 10 i save the file and now refresh the page now we have a is less than b and b is less than c we save the file we refresh the page and now we have a is less than b and b is less than c so we're checking two condition with uh, with this now if I change this to 
greater than c now one of these conditions is false a is less than b which is true but b is not greater than c so let's say refresh the page and now we have a is not less than b so we basically printing out this condition so compiler is executing this block of code and not this block of code makes sense guys now we know and so let's take a look at r now so if i change this to r with the pipe symbol i save the file and let's refresh the page and now we get a is less than b and b is less than c so if one of these conditions is true it's going to execute the statement in that block which means or is basically check whether this is true or this is true any of this true then please go and execute the statement and means this is true and also this is true as well then you go inside of our uh, block of statement so here if i say a is b a is less than b and we can say and we can simply say b is greater than or b is less than c now this conditions both both conditions are true so i'm going to encapsulate in a parenthesis so I'll just do a parenthesis here and then after that i'm going to say and c is equal to we can check with the strict 20 okay and now i'm going to save the file let's Go and refresh the page we should see a is less than b and b is less than c now what if i change this to let's just say r and i will change this to false because b is not greater than c now any of this condition will be true that means this is all good now let's go to the end operator and then check the rest of the condition so we're gonna say refresh the page now it has a is less than b and b is less than c so now if i change this to and i'm going to save the file and refresh the page now we're getting a is not less than b because this has to be true the both has to be true which is not so that's why we're not really executing this line of code so i hope this makes sense we have a and operator we have or we have a not operator as well so not operator will be discussed more in details because it's easier to look at but it's harder to use so yeah we'll talk about that in the later in the course welcome back in this video we are going to talk about one of the most important data structure available in javascript and also this data structure is available in pretty much any programming language out there I'm talking about arrays. Arrays are very important to understand because they will be used heavily in your programming. So let's go down. Let's talk about what is an array and why do we need array. So let's just change the color to this. And uh, we are going to say we need an array. But first question is why we need an array. For example, this guy here is going for a shopping. So he says, oh, I'm going to go a shopping today. Okay, now he needs to create a list of items he wants to buy. For example, he wants to buy milk, he wants to buy banana, banana, and also let's just say uh, meat, okay and just some cookies okay now that list is going to be stored somewhere in programming we need to store our values into something where we can retrieve so let's say if we want to create a variable for milk we want to create a variable for banana for meat and for cookies that's going to be a lot of code so that would be var milk right and then a value for that and so on that's not a good thing to do that's what we don't really want to do we want to store these values into an array now we define an array by using the var keyword and then the name for the array which we call in programming as identifier 
and then we use an array literal. Let's take a look how we define an array in JavaScript. So let's have some sexy color for that. So we define an array by defining a keyword var. And remember, we can use let and const as well, which we haven't talked about it. We'll talk about these in the next module of the course. We say var, and I'll name it array. Okay. And then is equal to, which is an assignment operator. And then we are going to use a square bracket as an array literal. So when we say array, we want to have to have a values inside square brackets. And we define an array right now. If we try to access this array on the console, you will get an empty array. So we want to put some values into array. How do we do that? There's a few ways that you can put a values. So for example, first of all, let's add a value of milk inside an array. So I will say array, let's just change the color to yellow. I'll say array, array milk, okay? So we wanna to have to say is equal to milk, okay? This is going to be string, so I'll add square uh, double quotes around it. All right, so now I will say array is equal to milk, but what do you mean by array is equal to milk? Where in the location it is going to get stored? Because we want to store a multiple values inside an array. We want to store uh, milk, we want to store banana, meat, and cookies, right? So we will store values inside an array according to the index. So let's just say, we say square bracket here, and we type the index we want to store this value to. So we say zero index. And then we will say array and then index one, we can set that in banana. Okay? And then we go array index two, we can say meet and then array three is equal to cookie. Okay, so this is how you store the values in an array. Now, this is a lot of code. We have to say array zero, array one, array two is equal to this, array three is equal to uh, this. This is a lot of code. We don't want to write that. This is not the way you, you can add a value to an array on a specific index, but when you define an array, array will always start from zero index. So that's why I'm just going to remove this line of code here. And I want to just make array and put the values inside array right on the same line. So I will do by defining var array is equal to and I'll say okay I want to add milk at index 0 and we we'll say banana at index 1 now how do I know if it's storing on a proper index I'll show you that in a second so we'll say meat and we we'll say cookie okay and then we add that in an array now take a look at this when we define this way compiler would automatically assign the index for milk for banana for meat and for cookie in an array and array or index space so what is the starting index for array it's zero array in javascript will always start from index zero and then onward. So that would be zero, and then we have a two, and then we three for a cookie. So this is how you define an array in another way. And also, I think it's time for us to take a look at the demo for this. So we'll go to the code, and here I'm going to go to script.js file, and I'll say var, uh, let's just say array is equal to, and then I'm going to just leave that an empty array. 
okay so now let's go to the browser let's refresh the page and here i want to type array press enter and it gives me array back but it says length is zero and also we haven't talked about objects because objects is like a very important topic so we have a separate video for that and just just say that everything in javascript is an object okay so we'll talk about object but it's array is empty right now so we go back to the code and here i want to say array index zero okay is going to be milk i want to save the file and then let's go and refresh the page and go to the console and say array press enter and now it gives me an array but it gives me a milk on a zero index what if we want to store this on different index? If I say five, I'm going to save the file. Let's go back and refresh the page and we type array here, press enter. And now, as you can see, that it says empty x5. Now, the milk is being stored on index five, okay? Which basically we have index zero, one, two, three, four, empty right now. So we can verify that as well. So if I say array and I say, give me what's inside an array. So I say enter, it gives me it's undefined. But if I say array, give me index five, that should give me milk. So you can specify the index by defining a specific index right there. But if you simply go and add a values inside an array, for example, if I say, okay, milk, and we have banana, we have meat, we have cookie. Now, as you can see, one thing I did mention, you separate a value by defining a comma. So you type a comma if you wanna define another value inside an array. If I save this file, and let's go back and refresh the page. And now if I say, give me what's in array, press enter, that gives you four values inside an array. So on zero index, we have a milk, we have a banana on index one, we have meat on index two, and a cookie on index three. So what if I have something like empty string here? Okay, we have an empty string here and I press uh, another double code here and a comma here, okay? And then double code here. Okay, so we have a three empty strings here. So I'm gonna save the file and let's just refresh the page and then we type array, press enter. And now as you can see, it's still stored an empty value. So these are double quotes. There's nothing in there, but the value is there. The index has been used for that. So whenever you type comma, that means that you are defining another value. So the previous value, whether it's empty or whatever is that, it's gonna be used as an index. Now you're probably thinking, okay, I wanna store some kind of a different data type inside an array. So it says, let's just say we can store a Boolean. Also, we can store some numbers. So let's say number. And then we can also store another array inside an array. So if I say, okay, there's another array which has a value of, let's just say, second array, comma, new array. I'm just having the random values. Press save. And now if I go and refresh the page and let's type array, I press enter. And now as you can see, we have an array, first array which has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we have a true as a Boolean data type stored in this array. We have a number stored in that array. And also we stored another array inside an array. You can do that as well. So one array can contain multiple arrays and this array can contain multiple arrays. So it's getting a bit complicated, but don't worry. Just wanted to show you that you can store any kind of a value, uh, any kind of a data type value inside an array on specific index. So these were a few scenarios that you can use array. There's a lot of methods available in the documentation, which we'll start looking at in the, in the start of the next module. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about functions. Functions are one of the fundamental building blocks in JavaScript. 
A function is a JavaScript procedure or a set of statements that performs a task, let's say a calculator value or a function which logs a message to the console. To use a function, you must define it somewhere in the scope from where you call it. So how do we define a function? First of all, let me write function, okay? This word, well, I have written the wrong spelling, so I-O-N, functions. This is the important topic. You need to understand function, what they do and why they are so useful in programming and everyone uses functions. Doesn't matter if they're using JavaScript or C++ or Python, or any language. So how do we define a function? A function definition, which also called a function declaration or a function statement, consists of a function keyword. So we define a keyword function. Okay, and then we define a name for a function. So in this case, I will say log, all right? And then we use a parentheses and inside the parentheses, we can define a multiple parameters. Now, I will talk about what is a parameter in a second. But after we define all the parameters, we open a curly brace, which is a block of statements that we will be running inside of a function. So JavaScript statement that defines the function enclosed in curly braces. So we define a curly braces. Now all this part is a part of this function. So whenever this guy gets called, then it will run all of this code. Okay, let's remove this line of code. Now, what we can do with the function. For example, if I want to write something to the console. So I will say, okay, please print this message hello function to the console. Now, as we know, the print function cannot be used to write to the console. So we want to modify this line of code. We want to say, okay, let's just move this first a bit here and then over here. And then we say console.log and there you go. So now when we write this function, we call the function log and we want to basically print out this message. Now, can you please pay attention here? What is console.log? What is console.log? Well, this is a function that's what we've been using. That is a function, okay? Now, I know this might be confusing, so let's take a look at a coding demo, and then we come back and take a look at theory a bit more. So here, we wanna go to our uh, WebStrom IDE, and here we wanna start by defining a keyword function, okay? And then a log for a name of the function. And here we can leave that empty, or we could say A comma B comma C. These are all the parameters that we will not want to talk about right now. But inside of our code log, we can say console.log and say hello to function, right? Now I'm going to save the file and we go to the console and refresh the page. And as you can see, it didn't do anything, right? Because in the code, we have not called this. So let's go back. Now, let's just say you wrote a function. This is your function. And now it's sitting somewhere. Let's go down. Let me give you a demo in theory. So let's say this is a function, which is basically uh, a function, which does something here, okay? Now, I'm this guy, okay? and I need to perform a task, okay? I need to call this, hey, can you please do this for me? And this function will do and can return a value to me, or it can perform the task and then show something to our web page, okay? So let's go back to the code, and here we will say, go down and say log, and I'm going to just see, leave that here. I'm gonna save the file, and let's just go here. Now I'm gonna refresh the page, 
and now it didn't do anything. So how do we run this? We're going to run the function by calling the name of the function and then adding parentheses right next to it and add a semicolon. I'm going to save the file and let's go and refresh the page. And this time we can see that hello to a function has been printed onto a console because we called this function. Okay. Now let's go back to the theory now. And let's say now we created a log function, which was basically writing something to the console. So I want to create a function which will take a message from us and then we'll write a console. So let's say this is the console and this is our function. And this is the guy who is calling that function. Okay. Now this guy is going to send a message to the function and that would be, let's say, hello guys. Okay, this guy sent the message to the function and this is going to perform its task and it's going to write the message to the console and here we will have hello guys. Okay, now this will take how we are going to pass in something to the function. To do that, we need to create a hole here. So I'll just remove this and I'll say, okay, this is a line of code. And this is the hole where we are going to use to push the value inside the function. So the value would be hello and hello guys. And that can be number, a boolean of another function, or it could be an array or an object, anything like that. But let's take a look at in a demo now. So let's go to the code. And now I'm going to just remove this and I'm going to go and push make a hole. A hole is a parameter of our function. So we can say, hey guys, take this, hey guy, take this, and that would be a parameter that would be assigned to that value. So you say, okay, I'll say message. And then instead of writing this string, I can simply say, please console log that message. Now we can call this function saying, okay, log, and then it will expect a parameter. So we say in a string, let's say, okay, hello guys. I'm gonna save the file. Let's go and refresh the page. There you go. We have a okay, hello guys. So I can call that function right in the console as well. So say log, and I can pass in a value of please print this in console. Press enter. And there we go. We wrote, please print this into console. So instead of writing this console.log again and again, which is a longer, we created a function which takes the message and writes the message to the console and made our life easier. So now we can do a bit of calculation with the function. We create a log function. Now it's time for us to create a function. We will add two values and return the result to us. So let's take a look at the theory first. So I will create a function. So let's just say a function here. And I'll name it calc. Okay. And that will take a first value. So we can say first value, or I can just say A. Second value, B. And then we add a code block. And then we want to add this. So inside the function, we can create another variable. Not to make you guys confused, we can still return this directly, but let's take a look. Okay, so we create a variable, let's say result. And we set is equal to A, plus B. Now we created this function and this guy call this function. Okay. And this guy sends the value, let's just say two and two. Okay. So that a will be assigned to two that will be assigned to two. Okay. Now it goes inside the function. It will create the, a variable result. And let me just remove this a bit here. Let's change the color so it's easier to look. So we have result and that will be two plus two, which becomes four. So that will 
basically change that to four and store four into this variable called result. But how do we get the value back? How do we get the value back from this function? We do that by using a return keyword inside the function. So if I say return, let me just go back and change the color. Let's say return result to me. So we say result. Okay. Now it's going to take the values from us and then do its calculation and then return the result to us. Okay, so let's have a look at in basically in a diagram. So let's just say this is a function. We created two loopholes inside this and that will do some kind of a, a logic here. Okay. Let me, I'm really bad in drawing guys. So it takes two values and then it will return the value back to the guy. So this is a guy who calls this function. Okay. And its name is calc. Okay. And then this guy has to pass the value two and then this value two. So it does its calculation and then it will return the result of that. So that would be, let's just say result. And that would be four going back to it. And now you can do whatever you like with the four. Let's take a look at it uh, in programming. So we create a log function, which will take the mass and write in the console. We leave that on the top. And now down there, we create a function. So we define a function keyword and we say calc. And then that's going to take A and B, all right? And then we can simply say var well, result is equal to A plus b and then we store the result we added two values a and b inside a result and then we return result all right and now we can call this function so we can say okay can you please call this function so i'll say okay uh calc two comma four let's save the file let's go to the browser and let's take a look so here it did not print anything, all right? So it didn't really uh, write the message to us. So what we can do here, we can use our log function, which we created to make our life easier and give the result value to the log function and that will print the value for us. So we say, okay, I'm gonna call a log function first and then the log function will take a message and message can be a returned value from our calc function. So we say calc and we'll say two comma two. All right, and now save the file and let's refresh the page and that should print four to our console because we got back four, but we didn't do anything with it. We need to log this to see the result. So we use our log function to do that. Okay, now we understand how we can return the values from the function and we can send the values to the function to do the calculation. So here we've just been sending some numbers and we've been sending a string value. You can pass in array, a boolean, a null, undefined, a symbol, or even our own function. As we just did, we pass in a calc function inside of a log function, right? So you can pass in anything to your function and that parameter, which basically waiting for the value come, will assign itself to its value. And also, let me show you one thing. Let's go to back to the theory. And here we say function, I would say A, B, C, and this has A, B, C, okay? And then I roughly do that. Now, if I call this A, B, C, A, B, C, and inside the parentheses, the first value, whatever I type here, that will be assigned directly to A, okay? And I type comma, and whatever the value I put in here, that will be automatically be assigned to B comma and with whatever the value I put it here that will be assigned to E. So that goes like uh, first value goes to first parameter, second value goes to second parameter, third value goes to third parameter. So you gotta keep an eye on what you pass into the function according to the way it's expecting. 
All right, so we'll take a look at functions in details later in the course and yeah, enjoy writing your own functions. Let's take a look at the function hoisting. So what is a function hosting? Now, let's go and define a function here. For example, if I create a function var and I'll say my function is equal to, we can say function, and I will say a, b, and then we have a code block, and that's going to return a multiplied by b. Now, before I create this function in the code, if I call this function, let me just move this a bit down. All right, let's put it down. Now, before I create this function, if I call this function, uh, let's just say we call my function and we'll pass in two comma two. Now, what is gonna happen? Let's take a look at the demo. So let's go to the code and I'm just going to remove this console log. And now I'm going to define a function after I declare it. So I'm gonna use the function after I declare it. So before I declare it, sorry, my bad. So we say my function and I'll say a two comma two. All right, I'm gonna save the file. And now we can do a log for that as well. And let's see if we say console.log. And let's see if we receive a value. Let's refresh the page and we should see an error. It says my function is not a function. All right, why are we getting this error? It's because when you use a function which hasn't been declared, obviously this is gonna cause an error because JavaScript is the interpreted language. It creates, it compiles your code line by line. So if you're using a function before it has been declared, that will cause an error because it does not know that what we are talking about because that function will be down the road. It will know about the function after a few lines or just after the line. So at that state, it does not know what what is y function. That is why it's causing an error. Now to fix that, there is something called a function hosting. So hosting in JavaScript is a default behavior of moving declaration to the top of the current scope. So if I change this to, let's just say, a function, and I will say, okay, my function, I'm gonna save the file, and now let's go back and refresh the page. And this time we know that we're getting the value. So you can look at the source here as well by just going to the source and you can see that it is passing and using this function. Now this is a default behavior of a JavaScript called function hosting. So it will grab that function and put it all the way on the top of the file. So the, the reason why it's doing it is because we are declaring a function with this function declaration. So when you use the function declaration like that, it will put that function right on the top and after everything can call it because it's right on the top. It's been declared first. So now we know about function hosting as well. Now functions can be used as in the values as we've seen. Functions can be used in an object and also a function itself is an object, okay? We'll talk about objects in the next video, but just uh, put that in your mind that function is an, an object and everything else in JavaScript is an object. We'll talk about this uh, really soon. Welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about loops in JavaScript. We have three kinds of loop in, and we can call it legacy loop. For example, for loop, while loop, and do while loop. But we're gonna also look at uh, newer loops for off loop and for in loop, which were available in uh, ES6 or ES7 version of JavaScript. First of all, let's try to understand why we use loops, why they're available in pretty much any programming language, and why they are so useful. Now, let me write this loop, okay? 
That is a very important concept that you need to understand to perform your uh, some task in your code. For example, let's just say this guy is a uh, code, okay? And you wanna run this code 10 times around this circle, okay? Now, what do we need? First of all, we need to create this guy that can be a variable, for example, var a, okay? And also, we need to know how many times we are going to run this, and that would be our condition, okay? You can call it condition. Next, we need to have an iterator. So let's just say we want to make sure that we reach up to that condition at one state where condition has to be false. So let's just say if our condition is true, it is going to keep running and running around, okay? But once it gets false, let me just put this here, false, that's when it's going to stop the loop. So this guy is going to come here, okay? Let me just change the color which makes it a bit nicer okay now this guy will come here and will start the loop from here and it's gonna run around okay and then once you get to this point it's gonna look for this condition here if that condition t returns true then it's gonna go back here and then start running again okay every time it's going to reach to this point it's going to come and like check the condition if it's true it's going to run again and if it's false it's going to stop the loop there now this was a theory theoretical concept of a loop now let's take a look how we can create a loop in javascript so we create a for loop by using a keyword for so we type for and then add parentheses and then we have a code block where Basically, we write our statements, which is going to run when we run this loop or we call this loop. So first thing, we need to create an entity or something which is going to perform that loop. So we can say var a, and I can set the value to zero. And then I add a semicolon. Next, we're gonna type a condition. So condition, let's just say, we can say, okay, if var, a is equal to let's say maybe we can say equal to five all right and then we can say a plus plus now what's happening here this is our guy here okay this is is going to perform the loop this is our condition let me just put this down so we have a condition here and this is called iterator Okay, now what's happening here? When the for loop comes here, it says, okay, a is zero. Now I understand a is there, its value is zero. Then it goes to the next condition, say, okay, a is five. Well, it's not right because a is zero. Our condition is already false, okay? It is not going to run this loop. So what's gonna happen? We wanna make sure that our condition at least becomes true for the number of times we want to run this loop. So instead of using this, I am going to change the color and I'll say if A is less than five. So now let's go and check. Okay, we got this guy, A, and then we go to the next line. We see, okay, condition that becomes true. Nice, right? And then it goes to this line, okay? And this line basically saying that please, A is equal to A plus one. We've already seen increment and decrement operators. So we know we basically added one to the value of A. So let me just remove this code. Now, now it's gonna go and run this code. So we say console dot log and we will just print out a okay now it's gonna go come first time and then run this block of code okay now next time when the compiler goes to uh, run this again because condition was true this value of zero is no more there because we have added one to the a now it has become one okay the value of 
a is one now. Now, once it becomes one, then it goes to this line of code and say, okay, a is still less than five because its value is one. It hasn't uh, gone over five. So it goes to the next line and then again perform this task, say a is equal to a plus one. And now the a is, the a has a value of two. And then every time it comes here, that increments the value. Now a, when a becomes five, that's when this condition of ours becomes false. Okay, now loop is not gonna run anymore because our condition has become false. So this was a theoretical concept of loop. Now let's go and take a look at this as a demo in a code. So we are going to basically, uh, this is one of my project here, I'm just gonna stop that. All right, so I'm going to print uh, a number on the console 10 times. For that, I need to use a loop. So I'll say for, and first of all, let's say var a is equal to zero, semicolon, and then var, not var actually, a less than 10, okay? Then we say i, so a plus plus, and then code log, we can simply say console.log a value of a. Okay, now it's gonna come here. It's gonna see, okay, I'm I'm creating this variable and then it's gonna check for the condition. So the condition becomes true. It's gonna go and add one inside A. So let's just run this code. Let me just refresh the page and here we go. We got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then if we wanna print out till one to 10, then we will make this, uh, let's just say, uh, a is 1 and then a is less than 11. Let's save and let's refresh the page. Now we have 1, 2, 10. Now what if we write some kind of a condition which is never going to uh, become, which is never going to become uh, false or never going to become true. So let's just say if we say if a is equal to 11. I'm going to save the file. I'm gonna refresh the page. Now we don't see anything because the first time loop run, this condition is not true at all. So if I say, okay, if 11, A is equal to 11, now what's gonna happen? Now this condition, A is equal to 11, and then A is equal to, it checks that like if A is 11, yes, it is 11, then we're gonna refresh the page and then it's gonna print out 11 there because that was true once. Okay, and if now, let's just say we can have an infinite loop. So we write a condition where it's never gonna be a fault and loop is always going to run. So I'm just scared about running that code because it could crash my computer because it's not gonna stop at all. We do that by, let's just say if we say A is equal to zero and we can say if A is greater than let's just say itself uh let me just say if a is greater than one okay then we are going to stop the increment okay we're going to stop the increment there now i'm going to save the file and refresh the page it's not going to run so if a is less than one and instead of just incrementing we're not incrementing anything now let's just say refresh See this, one, two, three, this is infinite loop now. So we're running and printing out zero an infinite time. Okay, we have to stop this because it's gonna crash the my browser. So as you can see, we did not add anything to A and that condition never becomes false. So that's why we're basically just going through the loop and loop and loop, yeah? So you gotta make sure that you don't do that. So I'm actually going to add this to A++. Okay, let's refresh the page. And now uh, it's just basically stuck. So we have to open this index.html page again into the browser. So I'm gonna close that page there. That's basically blocked everything. Now open the console, that's fine now. Okay, so you gotta make sure you don't run into infinite loop. And we've seen the for loop. And also we wanna check uh, while loop as well. So we have a while loop, basically we can say if the condition is 
true, then do this. So let's just say we want to modify this. So say while, and I'll say a is less than, let's say five. And then we want to do something here. So I can say console.log and I'm going to say value of a. Now where is a coming from? We can define it on the top while a is equal to one. Okay, I'm going to save the file. Let's just refresh the page. And there you go, it just ran infinitely because we did not really add anything to A anymore. So it's just gonna keep running. We have to increment A here. So inside that A++, we always run into infinite loop, guys. That's not a good idea. So we refresh the page. See this 10,000 time it rained. Uh, that's, that's, that's not good for your computer. So you go back, index.html and then we open up, I'm gonna close this, close this, and there you go. So now we run three, two, three, four, five, okay? Because we're incrementing A here. So this is like we give condition first and then let it run our code. Now there is called a do while loop, which basically runs the code and then checks the condition. So we can check that as well. So let's just say do this. So we use the keyword do. And I will say, okay, I'm going to ask you to please console.log a value. And then after the code log, we type a keyword while, and then we add our parentheses and then we type the condition if a is less than five. This is going to be infinite loop because a is never gonna reach to five. So we have to increment a here. So a plus plus, let's save the file. And let's just refresh the page. And again, we can see it rained the code. And then after that, it checks the uh, condition one, two, three, four. Now there's other loops as well, which we'll talk about in the module of ES6. I hope you understood the loops. Uh, they're very useful. They're everywhere in your program because you're gonna be running the, the code repeatedly a lot of times. So you make sure that you get your heads around with this code.